All is right in the world as TikTok dances to some of the most popular songs can resume. Taylor Swift and Drake's music are back on TikTok. The record label for some top artists, including Drake and T-Swift, Universal Music Group, or UMG, reached a new licensing agreement with TikTok yesterday, ending a months-long clash between the companies. UMG said in a statement yesterday that the deal would lead to the return of its artist music to the social media platform. Back in January, TikTok pulled songs from artists signed to UMG after each party failed to come to an agreement on content licensing. Music from many artists then became unavailable on the app until now. This comes as the United States government has pursued efforts to ban TikTok in the United States. Joe Biden signed a bill on April 24th that would ban the ByteDance-owned video app if the Chinese company does not sell the platform within a year. So we can dance to Taylor Swift and Drake today, but a year from now we might not be able to dance from any music no matter how popular it is or who the artist is signed by in a year. It's, a, it's a interesting to consider what their stake is in the content licensing. I want to start with the music stuff because as a creative person, I find that interesting because you do have some people streaming the songs, 30 seconds to a minute of them on TikTok, and maybe that disincentivizes them from supporting the artist or them you know, getting the proper compensation for their work. Uh, I don't think the Spotify and Apple Music streaming platforms give that much money. So TikTok must have been abysmal. It's known for not paying content creators as much as other platforms for the ad sharing, but also it's a very music-based app. I don't know that it took a major hit after UMG wasn't on there, but I think they have a lot of negotiating power having these popular artists, and I think people believed they would eventually broker a deal. Had they never, it might have hurt TikTok a bit because it's so music-based, but we're in an interesting world around how artists get compensated when it's streaming. It's not purchasing records at a store and you get a physical copy or listening on the radio. Yeah, that's a good point. I remember, you know, since we're talking about Taylor Swift's music group, UMG, a few years ago, um, she pulled her music off of Spotify. She claimed she was doing it in protest for smaller artists who can't make a living with just streaming royalties. Spotify pays something like half a cent, if not less, per stream. So if you're a small artist, you basically get you know three dollars for every thousand streams that you might get on Spotify. So obviously, you can't make it in the music industry just on that, you have to either sell records or sell out shows or uh, or perhaps put money put uh, music on YouTube. You can't just do it on Spotify and Apple Music. And she did eventually come back to the platform, interestingly enough, on the same day that Katy Perry apparently dropped her record, which was seen as some as something of more of a petty personal feud than actually ending her longstanding anti-Spotify streak. Um, but it didn't seem like her protest changed a whole lot in terms of how much artists actually get compensated on these platforms. And uh, I'm not aware of how much TikTok pays these artists either, um, especially considering its influence on music, right? We've seen some mashups and remixes and sped up versions of songs getting incredibly popular on TikTok. And there's even a serious XM uh, station now dedicated to songs and music that have gone viral on TikTok because people are using them to dances or to some certain trend that's happening. And it's really not clear what happens when artist music is used that way. And uh, I mean, these are all private companies and apparently the artists don't have any real copyright claims so long as they're getting compensated something. So um, it's difficult because artists have to decide, is it worth it for me to put my music on the streaming service in the hopes that I'm gonna go viral, that one of my songs is gonna be a big hit and that I can make it in the industry. But in the meantime, if I, that doesn't happen, I'm basically making pennies on the dollar for this art that I'm producing. And it's not an easy calculation for everyone to make. It does feel very wrong that the people doing the work, the creative minds, the people who produce the music, who sing the songs, who play the instruments, are, are oftentimes compensated the least. And it's, it's not just true in this industry, it's true in a lot of our economy where construction workers who are putting their lives on the line, doing you know 30 plus years of manual labor every single day, a lot of them get injured, they're making 
stuff with their own two hands and fixing stuff with their own two hands and maintaining stuff with their own two hands, big machinery, building buildings, building homes, doing the necessary work so that we can all live our lives and have a, a high functioning economy. They are the economy. And then you have people who own the companies and invest in them, making the majority of the money. There needs to be some equalization that happens in our economy so that the people contributing the most also get compensated the most and or at least more fairly. I think that we are way too far apart from, you know, the working class and the ruling class. We're way too far apart from, you know, what equality would look like in a society. And it's at the point where the people at the top have so much money that they can influence our discourse because they control media companies and push narratives that would suggest well, oh, look at these artists, they're living lavish lives. Look at how much Taylor Swift flies on her jet while ignoring the top billionaires that operate behind the scenes that aren't a public face, their impact on the climate and world and the lavish lives they're living. But because they're not the artists we care about, we don't see them. And so there needs to be an equalization of compensation and accountability for what's going on economically in the world. In addition to some of the profit problems with streaming services, there's also been a lot of debate over the apparent monopolization of the concert ticket industry, where Ticketmaster has basically bought up a bunch of smaller companies and has a, a basically a monopoly on ticket sales. And some artists have protested by trying to avoid using Ticketmaster, um, by getting rid of some of the fees on the platform, or trying to uh, cap ticket prices at a certain amount because they have expressed concerns that their fans who can't afford a $1,000 concert ticket to go see them are basically getting priced out of seeing their shows because of how Ticketmaster uses its tiered pricing system. Zach Bryan is a, uh, was an independent country music artist. He's now signed with a label who attempted to do this with one of his previous tours. He has this sort of tagline, all my homies hate Ticketmaster but is recently um, now back to selling tickets on Ticketmaster. And so it's kind of unfortunate, I think, that more of the bigger artists don't band together if they have a problem with this system to try to change it. Um, again, Taylor Swift's protests didn't really last that long and uh, didn't seem to change a whole lot, but I think if people joined her and people like Zach Bryan and protesting Spotify, Ticketmaster, Apple Music, some of these other platforms' policies, they could actually make a difference. Um, we haven't gotten into the TikTok potential ban yet. I know we've talked about it previously on the show, Jess, but um, of course, TikTok now has a year to divest from ByteDance, which is its parent, co parent company that has ties to China. There's been some chatter about um, some U.S. funders putting together a deal to try to buy the app, one of which includes the former Treasury Secretary for Donald Trump, Steve Mnuchin. Um, do you have any uh, you know, inklings about who might actually buy TikTok, whether or not they're going to be able to get the sale done in a year, and uh, ultimately if this ban is going to go through? Yeah, what's that guy on Shark Tank? Kevin something said he was Kevin interested O'Leary. in buying it. Yeah, I don't know if I buy that he's interested in buying it. I think uh, there's not someone with the amount of money to, to give to TikTok that I think the app is worth. And I think that's the biggest problem here is that it's it's become just such a, a monster, such a massive tech platform, the most popular online destination in the world to buy TikTok US. They're making calculations about revenue the app will bring in, you know, 30 years from now. Is there one person who's willing to front that money? It's going to have to probably be, you know, a few different investors. And what will that company look like? Will be will they be able to put together the infrastructure, what personnel wise, but also tech wise, in order to to continue on with the TikTok app? There's all kinds of weird language that I'm sure lawyers are going to have to get very heavily involved in interpreting around what staff currently at TikTok US can stay there, if any. Some stricter interpretations of the law would suggest that no one who presently works at TikTok can work at the new company after it is sold. That is a world where the people who understand how to keep the app running, how to do the backend technology, how to manage the creators and campaigns and ad revenues and all of those relationships, how, how would a transfer of, of power happen in any meaningful way that allows the app to continue? Then you also have the, the back-end technology. What code can continue to be used? Can the app be programmed in the same way? What can they still rely on that already exists? And so because of all these big legal questions as well, 
is a year even enough time to sort all of that out? And so when you consider the massive amount of money that will take, massive amount of money take to purchase the app for what it's worth, I'm just not optimistic that a year will be enough time for this to happen. And I, I do see a world where TikTok does end up getting banned and they're like, well, we did everything we could to give it a chance. When in reality, the legislation wasn't written in a way that provides that opportunity. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. I, I know that during the negotiation process for the legislation that they did extend the timeline. That was one of the sticking points for some of the lawmakers who were planning on voting against it. They tried to expand the timeline over which the sale um, needed to take place. But as you said, a lot of legal questions, obviously, that are going to be involved as we move through this process. That's going to do it for us this week on Rising. But don't worry, we'll be right back here next Friday. Jess, as always, great to see you. Always great to be with you. I'll see you there in person next Friday. Awesome. Can't wait. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we are now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Bye, y'all.